Hello, everybody, and welcome to the MetroVision Idea Exchange Planning for Multimodal Mobility. My name is Kevin Priestley, and I'm an assistant planner here at the Denver Regional Council of Governments, or Dr. Cog. I'm joined today by Emily Lindsay, uh, also with Dr. Cog, and Paul DeRocher. I said that right. Yep. Yes. Good. Paul of the Rocks um, with RTD, um, who will be discussing regional initiatives to improve multimodal mobility in the Denver region. Here is our agenda for today. I have a short set of announcements. Sorry for the technical glitches at the beginning of the session, everybody. Um, so here is the announcements uh, handout or uh, announcement slide for today. Um, I do have a short set of announcements that I'm going to run through uh, before I turn it over to our speakers. Um, these announcements are available as a PDF in the handouts pane of your GoToWebinar panel. I'll also just mention that we have a troubleshooting GoToWebinar um, uh, download that's also there available. So if you run into any audio or video issues with the webinar today, um, you can download that and uh, troubleshoot a little bit on your own. Dr. Cog's Way to Go team is preparing for GoTober. GoTober is an employer-sponsored challenge to encourage employees to try new, fun, money-saving, and stress-reducing ways to commute to work while competing against other companies for glory and prizes. Company employees are challenged to commute in new ways, think walking, biking, riding transit, or carpooling, as many times as possible in October, and to track their trips online. Company registration has already passed. However, um, if your company is involved in GoTober, uh, just make sure that you register because it kicks off next Tuesday. The Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan includes the Denver region's long range vision for transportation infrastructure and service needs and funding options for the next 30 years. The plan is updated every four years, and Dr. Cog will be working on this update over the next two. As the region continues to build out its transportation infrastructure, we want to know what's working and what isn't. We also want to know how you think funds should be spent. The easiest way to take the survey, if you're listening in right now, is to use a QR code reader, and you can scan that code directly off your computer screen. I did test it uh, yesterday, so it should work for you all. You can also take the survey by typing the links you see on your screen into your browser, or by downloading the announcements PDF from the handouts pane on your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, surveys are available in both English and Spanish, and you can find some more, web, uh, more information on Dr. Cog's website. Um, and we just ask that you please take the survey, share your thoughts, and share the survey with your networks. Dr. Cog has begun to solicit input for a regional Vision Zero plan. With your help, Dr. Cog will develop a vision, an action plan, and identify strategies to move the region towards zero roadway deaths and serious injuries. Like the previous slide, you can scan the QR code on your screen, you can type the links you see on your screen into your browser, or you can download that announcements handout uh, to access those links. Um, in addition to the two surveys that are available in English and Spanish, we also have an interactive map that's available online for you to submit comments about specific locations you think could be improved. Our colleagues in the Area Agency on Aging State Health Insurance Assistance Program, also known as SHIP, are getting ready to help folks in Arapahoe, Douglas, and Jefferson counties evaluate plans during the Medicare open enrollment window. This year, the open enrollment window will run from October 15th to December 7th. And if you're not in Dr. Cog's service area of Arapahoe, Douglas, or Jefferson counties, um, you can find information about enrollment assistance on the screen for Colorado, um, and there are some helpful links to find locations both in Colorado and nationwide. Um, we also have an online inquiry form for residents of Arapahoe, Douglas, and Jefferson counties, and you can find that form at www.drcog.org/ship. 
Um, every single county in the United States has one. So if you have an older adult in your life who qualifies for Medicare and needs uh, enrollment assistance, contact your county's SHIP office. Another fantastic way to stay informed about older adult issues is by tuning in to No Copay Radio, featuring Murphy Houston and the director of the Area Agency on Aging, Dr. Cog's Jayla Sanchez Warren. Sponsored by Dr. Cog and the Next 50 Initiative, this radio show gives you the inside story on health news for older Coloradans. You can listen live twice each weekend by tuning your dial to KECW 1430 AM, or you can listen anytime, anywhere at nocopayradio.com. With the generous support of APA Colorado, one AICP credit has been approved for attendees listening to this session live only. You can use the event number on the screen to log your credit on the American Planning Association website. My last slide for today, uh, you've all probably noticed that we are using GoToWebinar. Um, we will be accepting questions through the questions pane on your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, please submit questions at any time during the event today. We, are, we uh, actually ask that you provide questions as soon as they come to your mind. Um, that way it'll streamline our process as we go into the Q&A portion of the event today. In addition, we will be using uh, GoToWebinar's polling feature several times throughout the event. And just to get you used to the poll um, and how it looks, I have a poll, uh, a practice poll for you, uh, which asks about the transportation, um, uh, the transportation mode you use to travel to wherever you're watching the webinar from today. I realize that uh, some of you uh, are probably watching this webinar as a group or by yourself in the privacy of your own home, and um, so just choose the polling option that, uh, that best fits your answer. And I will give another, um, we'll give another 30 seconds. So we're about 60% of the way voted, so make sure your votes are in. All right. So I'm going to close down the poll, so you got another couple seconds. All right. And so to answer uh, how everyone voted, it looks like about half uh, drove alone um, into work today. And it looks like we've got pretty good numbers for transit, walking, and cycling, um, up to about 45% of the audience um, did not eat, drive alone. So about 50-50 breakdown there. Um, and with that, I am just really excited to introduce Emily Lindsay. Um, Emily Lindsay is the transportation technology strategist here at Dr. Cog, where she works to coordinate regional approaches to technology-related mobility policies, programs, and data. Emily's work in regional transportation planning led her to serve on the Transportation Review Board Standing Committee on Transportation Planning for Small and Medium-Sized Communities and the Colorado Safe Routes to School Advisory Committee. Emily has a Master of Urban and Planning degree from the University of Washington and a bachelor's from New York University. And I will kick off her presentation real quick with another poll. Um, and that is just to ask everybody how you think about, uh, about planning multimodal mobility uh, with your neighboring jurisdictions. And this will kick everything off. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Well, we will close down that poll. Um, so it looks like um, that most people agree with that statement. 
um, which, you know, about 52%, which means that we are thinking about um, regional approaches or planning multimobility infrastructure with neighboring jurisdictions. And with that, we'll kick it over to Emily. Yay. Thank you, Kevin. And it's good to hear you guys are already working together um, to solve some of these active transportation and mobility related issues. So just to give everyone a little bit of context about the region that Dr. Cog is talking about when we talk about active transportation and transportation planning, um, it's a really big region. It is a 10 county planning area. Um, it goes all the way up into the mountains. You'll see Clear Creek and Gilpin counties out to your west um, and then out into the plains and eastern Adams and Arapahoe counties. We go all the way up to Boulder and all the way down to Castle Rock. So again, this is a pretty large planning area. Um, over 3 million people live here today in this region, and we're anticipating um, around 1.3 million people by 2040. So Dr. Cog's overarching plan, Metro Vision, um, includes important active transportation elements, and it really promotes livable communities that meet the needs of people of all ages, abilities, and incomes. And so using Metro Vision's planning framework, um, and really looking through each of the different themes in Metro Vision that kind of cross land use and development to transportation um, and the natural environment and including healthy livable communities um, and even um, a little bit in there about the regional economy. We framed the active transportation plan um, to be kind of a holistic look at how we can achieve Metro Vision goals moving forward. Metrovision includes a bunch of performance targets um, and measures. I'm just going to talk about a couple of these to frame the active transportation kind of planning discussion. There is uh, a goal to have fewer than 100 traffic related fatalities by 2040. Um, in the region right now, we're around 266, so there's a lot of work to do on that front. Um, our Vision Zero effort that's underway now will certainly address this um, more clearly, but we do know that a large contingent of traffic-related fatalities impact bicyclists and pedestrians. While they make up around 3% of uh, all crashes, they're involved in close to a quarter of all fatal crashes. Another 2040 target is about mode share, really thinking through smart commute modes. So this isn't just active transportation, this is about carpooling, taking transit, um, and even telework. So thinking about increasing the percentage of those folks participating in smart commute options. And as you can see, kind of since 2010, there hasn't been a ton of, of movement in this space. I think we've seen telework rates really go up. Bicycling um, has gone up a little bit. Um, but we really want to think about, again, all of these modes together and how they impact our transportation system and our targets. And so active transportation, when thinking beyond the commute, really can contribute to a lot of our trips. In the Denver region, 43% of all of our trips, and this is utility trips, uh, so to work, to school, um, to the store, to visit your friends, 43% um, are less than three miles. So very walkable, very uh, bikeable, um, and then around 20% are less than a mile. So that's kind of that sweet spot, super bikeable, super walkable. Um, so how can we think about looking at these short trips um, in terms of active transportation? And we know out here in Colorado, a lot of folks bike and walk um, for fun, for exercise, about half of our population surveyed during one of our active transportation planning survey efforts um, said that they bike uh, for fun or for exercise. Um, and around 80% of folks said that they walk for fun or for exercise. Um, but those rates kind of go down when we start thinking about transportation um, and especially commute trips. And so we wanted to learn a little bit more from residents in the Denver region as we put together this active transportation plan. So we asked a bunch of questions. I just want to highlight a couple of those. Um, we asked folks what it would, if they would um, do these things, they would walk more. So I think not surprisingly, people indicated that if it didn't take so long, uh, they would consider walking more. And I think that at, at its face value, this seems pretty obvious. Um, but as we think about what Paul's going to talk about later, um, about first final mile solutions, thinking about li linking walking trips with other types of trips, um, and even thinking through active transportation on the whole in terms of um, innovations in walking and biking, 
And I think you'll see this even more clearly here um, that folks indicated that they would bike more to get places if it didn't take so long to bike. I think we're seeing micro mobility in bicycles uh, from e bikes uh, to bike share, really being able to tackle some of these problems. Um, another thing that we learned is about 60% of folks said they would bike more if they just knew the best and safest route. So just thinking through our inventory process um, and our journey planning tools for residents, letting them know about safety and comfort, it would make a difference. So kind of continuing a little report out of the survey work that we did from the active transportation plan, we wanted to learn about where people felt comfortable. And I think not super surprisingly, only about 5% of folks said that they would feel very comfortable on a roadway with no bicycle facility. Um, when you add a conventional bike lane, it's about a quarter of folks. Um, and then when you add a painted buffer, it kind of, it doubles, right? It's 40% of the population would feel very comfortable just with a little more paint and a little bit more space. And where you see the real difference is when you add in really comfortable facilities that have vertical separation elements. So you can see um, anywhere between 66 and 72% of folks would feel very comfortable in these separated high comfort facilities, um, whether they're cycle tracks, separated bike lanes, side paths, or shared use paths. So again, this kind of got us to better understand who we were planning for. Um, and again, I think like a lot of agencies really focusing on where we can see the most movement, and that's in that 60% of folks that are interested but concerned when it comes to bicycling. Um, Colorado, again, does, it doesn't really surprise us, but we were a little bit higher than the national average in the highly confident and somewhat confident groups of cyclists and um, lower in the non-bicyclists. So just to give you an overview of some of the principles that we included in our active transportation planning process, really centered around safety, comfort, and connectivity um, on both of the bicycle network and pedestrian network planning. So I'm not gonna go through all of these, but <laughs> really focusing on um, making sure that every mode has their own space and they feel comfortable um, they're providing kind of safe crossings at conflict points, making sure they are accommodating kind of those spaces where bicyclists and pedestrian mix. I think we learned that can be a little uncomfortable for both uh, modes rather than providing separation. And then obviously thinking through connectivity. And then on the pedestrian side, again, you kind of see the main three themes, safety, comfort, and connectivity, um, and really thinking through uh, traffic calming, appropriate speeds, thinking through, again, physical separation, making a really big difference in comfort. Um, and then up on the connectivity side, also thinking about routes and integrating uh, different pedestrian uh, networks with other services, whether it's transit um, or park and rides. And so in the active transportation plan, you'll see that there are a lot of different um, out products that kind of cover everything from emerging trends when we're really talking about micro mobility, e bikes, ride hailing, um, connected and automated vehicles. So, we included a little bit of info on each one of those things, including descriptions, local context, some implementation considerations, and then different resources to give our communities a, a, a point to go to. Um, additionally, we included information on policies, programs, and practices. So really thinking about some of the things that impact active transportation planning, whether it's complete streets, street design guidelines, um, streetscaping, what Paul is gonna talk about, first and last mile connections, um, even land use policies. And then on the infrastructure side, we didn't really want to become um, a design toolkit because I think there are so many of those, but we did want to provide some basic information on where people should go for this information, in addition to a little bit more um, clarity on, on the bikeway selection um, that really worked with our planning framework to support that safe, comfortable, and connected active transportation network. So you will see that in, in there as well. And then similar to how we frame our Metro Vision plan, that overarching plan, in the Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan, we wanted to provide and outline different opportunities that support bicycling and walking in the Denver region. Um, again, Dr. Cog has 58 different member governments, so there's a lot of work 
that doesn't get done at the regional level. And I think we recognize the opportunity that there is at the local level to support biking and walking, whether it's through collaboration, development of policies, plans, regulations, um, or actually like physical investments in the system. Um, but on the regional side, we definitely wanted to set ourselves up for success in implementing this plan by outlining a bunch of different opportunities um, that kind of range from collaboration, education and assistance, and investments. So, I think I finished up a little bit early, but hopefully we'll leave time for questions. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Emily. Um, and uh, before we kick things back over to Paul, um, we, I just have another poll for everybody, um, and this poll asks about, um, like, where are you, uh, for, for those communities who are, have engaged in multimobility planning, um, what kind of sources do you look at um, when you're crafting those plans? All right, we'll give another uh, 15 seconds or so. About two thirds of, uh, of attendees have, have voted. All right. Um, so closing down that poll and sharing it back with everybody, um, it looks like um, we rely often on uh, on the work of others. On um, it looks like about two thirds of folks um, have used strategies that have been put into practice successfully in another jurisdiction. Um, and so to kind of kick things off, um, Paul is going to talk about some of those strategies and, and a resource that's uh, readily available here in the Denver region. And um, to give you a little bit of background information on Paul, he is, the, he is a planning coordination manager with the Regional Transportation District, or RTD, where he has worked for three years in a variety of capacities, including transportation demand management, active transportation, transit, Para, paratransit operations, um, and more. Previously, Paul worked as a TDM manager for Smart Commute Metro North and 36 Commuting Solutions to transportation management associations here in the Denver region. Paul has a master's in city planning from the University of Pennsylvania and a bachelor's degree from Evergreen State College. And uh, with that, I'm gonna make sure to hide the poll results so that you can see Paul's presentation and I'll turn it over to Paul. Great, thanks Kevin. Um, before I get into the slides, I really want to take a moment to recognize all of the stakeholders that helped produce this plan. And as I think you'll hopefully gather as I get into some of the particulars of this plan, first and last mile really can't uh, exist or um, be responsible for by a single organization. So RTD is the transit authority for the Denver metro area. And as such, we control and, and operate transit service throughout the district. However, we don't impact or control much of the right of way that we operate within, nor do we impact or control transportation demand management, marketing, incentives, things that help people to use transit. So. When we put together this plan, we really wanted to focus on partnerships. And if I can say that, uh, and, if, and if you hear that through the presentation, it's because partnerships are really critical to first and last mile in terms of addressing the issue holistically. So I wanna give a shout out to all of our local jurisdictional partners throughout the Denver Metro area, Dr. Cog, CDOT, our Transportation Management Association partners, as well as our private partners who, uh, as Kevin had alluded to earlier, and, and Emily as well, have really made a big impact in first and last mile in terms of providing shared 
micro mobility options, as well as uh, transportation network companies as well, like Uber and Lyft. So uh, I guess with that, let's jump into the presentation. So why was the plan completed? Very simply, we wanted to make RTD more accessible to more people. What you're seeing here on the top left-hand corner is unfortunately a situation that exists throughout the metro area. Um, RTD as an agency, um, we are very much interested in serving high capacity, high volume corridors where most, most of the population has access to. But in doing so, we oftentimes find that our stations are located on arterials that are very difficult for pedestrians to access. And that's an important point when you think about the fact that particularly for bus service, 86% of our passengers access our stations and stops uh, by walking. And so if we're not creating hospitable pedestrian environments, we're cutting off a significant portion of the population that can or, or wants to use transit. And as Emily mentioned earlier, RTD has a very large district. Uh, it's not quite as large as Dr. Cog, but we're about 2,400 square miles, ranging everywhere from Broomfield to the north down to uh, Lone Tree in the south. And then, of course, you have the central business district of Denver in the middle. So a variety of different contexts in which we operate. So when you take those things into consideration, in particular the partnerships that I mentioned earlier, we had three primary goals for this plan. And, and again, defining those partnerships and the clear roles for implementation was really key. We also wanted to prepare for rapid changes in technology. And, and honestly, if I could sort of ad lib on this slide a little bit, it's frankly about catching up with rapid, rapid changes in technology. As a transit agency uh, and a large organization at that, we don't always move at the same speed as particularly private investment in technology. So we want to make sure that we're accommodating that because we know that a, a big portion of the population is relying on it these days. And then obviously transit accessibility and ridership. This is really the primary metric by which transit agencies judge themselves by. So we needed to keep those things in mind. It was an 18 month project. Uh, we started in January of last year. And as you can see, we've already wrapped up the report. And I'll mention now, uh, for those of you who are uh, interested, we have actually launched a web page at rtd-denver.com. So if you just Google RTD first and last mile, it's probably the easiest place to get there. Um, there are all of these, all of these sections of the study are on that project web page, and in particular those pilot projects. Uh, as you can see, that those are really the focus that we are. We are kind of, uh, that we're focused on at the moment right now. So again, just, I'll come back to that web page a little bit later, but uh, we are very much focused on implementation at this point now that the study is completed. When we did the study, as I mentioned, we have a very large service area. So we needed to generalize a little bit uh, in terms of what we were looking at in terms of first and last mile recommendations. So we broke down our stations into typologies uh, that I'll talk about here on the next slide. We also developed some overlays as well as a toolkit of recommendations. And then in particular, we looked at 15 representative stations. And again, I'll talk about more of these in detail as we get into this presentation. The primary typologies that we created were what you can see here. So urban core, urban, suburban mix, which is a mix of both residences and jobs and then suburban residential, which is sort of subtracting the jobs, and then rural. And the important takeaway from this slide here is that even though when people think about RTD, the very, the very first station that they think about is Union Station, which is really an excellent example of how making public investments in transit can lead to private development and over uh, $2 billion of investment at that, what we actually see is that 95% of RTD stations, the physical locations where we have stations and stops, exist in that urban, suburban mix, and suburban residential 
typology. And incidentally, that is also where you see the most difficulty with first and last mile accessibility or transit station accessibility. So those are the areas where we focused on through this study. So I mentioned the overlays. Here are some the first few uh, historically vulnerable populations. These are low-income non-native English speakers, uh, areas where you have high accessibility needs, uh, uh, persons who uh, you know, are either in uh, uh, mobility devices or uh, some other type of uh, accommodation. And we have high shift and visitor variability. These are places where you have high retail locations. Um, and that is important when you think about the usefulness of transit because most of our services is typically oriented around the 95 commuter. So if you're getting off work at midnight, um, we don't necessarily have the greatest service there. So how can first and last mile uh, help to address that? So another few bits of overlays here, uh, locations where we have high visitor trips. So think about uh, stadium districts, uh, places like that where you have huge crush loads of people coming in all at once, uh, areas of high propensity to change. This is honestly the, the entire Denver metro area, but there are particular locations where we are observing higher propensity to change. We want to make sure that those first and last mile uh, recommendations are fluid and can change with anticipated uh, um, changes in that area. And then locations where you have very high parking utilization. Because we know that if you can't find a parking spot and you're in a suburban location, you might not use transit at all. So these are overlays that add a little more detail to those typologies that I mentioned earlier and uh, help us to drill down a little bit closer. And when you think about those typologies and the overlays, they're essentially used to give us some guiding framework for applying that toolkit. And the five themes that we developed in that toolkit are shown here. So improvements and reuse of existing infrastructure and new infrastructure. Those are um, areas where you might think about traditional first and last mile accessibility, where you might be looking at filling sidewalk gaps, uh, bicycle networks, uh, things that Emily was talking about. First and last mile general guidance gets to more, I wouldn't say policy level things, but in general, things that are going to help improve first and last mile accessibility and, and frankly, the experience of using transit. So think about things like shade trees along pedestrian routes, shelter elements. When you get there, is there a bench? Is there real time transit information or even uh, transit oriented development and how land use can develop and can develop to better accommodate transit? And the last category is transportation services. So these are things like TNCs, uh, micromobility, shared scooters, uh, bike share, as well as local uh, feeder transit service. And then lastly, into the representative stations. So even though we took a, a sort of larger cut in terms of the look at the RT district and developing the station typologies and overlays, we also wanted to apply that, that framework and look at specific stations. So uh, what we did was take essentially a representative uh, uh, sample of stations throughout the district. And we tried to make sure that we were getting a sample where we were going to have stations that uh, epitomized an urban location, a suburban mixed location, and suburban res residential. So you can kind of see the stations that we chose there as well as stations that had uh, a good cross-section of those overlays as well, so we could see how that played out in reality. Um, in addition, before I get into the representative stations, we did a lot of public outreach, and frankly, this slide probably should have been at the beginning of the presentation, but obviously, when we were developing that first and last mile toolkit, we wanted to understand what was important to our stakeholders and particularly the people who are already using transit. So we surveyed uh, thousands, frankly, of uh, users throughout the district. You can kind of see a few pictures of how we engaged uh, passengers as they were boarding and alighting transit. And then we developed an online map where people could actually go and pinpoint specific first and last mile solutions that they might have. 
So the representative stations, the two that I wanted to focus on today are Wagon Road and Federal Alameda. Wagon Road is a suburban mixed typology. Uh, it also has an overlay of high parking utilization, whereas Federal Alameda is an urban station typology uh, that is uh, kind of epitomized by a lot of the pictures that you see here. There is a pedestrian network. It's not always the, the greatest quality, um, but this is a in particular, the federal corridor is one that the city and county of Denver has very much focused on because it has very high uh, pedestrian fatalities on it, unfortunately. And so in terms of, again, how people access transit by walking is the predominant mode, we really wanted to focus on that element there. The second step in the representative station um, uh, example here is, is the assessment and the analysis and what you're seeing here is a walk shed uh, analysis so the green splotch indicates where you can get within a 10 minute walk from essentially the center of that dotted radius so as you can see in federal Alameda with the presence of sidewalks that are there uh, you can access a significant portion and, and the reach that transit has for that area is really quite large. Whereas in the wagon road example, it's bordered by two very high volume, high speed corridors in being 120th and uh, Huron. And in that case, you can see where those corridors really break down the pedestrian network. And so again, in terms of making RTD more accessible, more people, we wanna really focus on making better accommodations for pedestrians where you see those high um, high volume, high speed corridors. So the next step in the representative station examples here are how we got to our recommendations. So one, one really important piece uh, in Wagon Road that I didn't mention is that it's a gigantic parking ride. There are over 1200 parking spaces at that location. However, 95% of them are highly utilized. So when we're thinking about what is the likelihood that people are going to use transit, we need to think about alternative ways to get there. And so we wanna better identify rideshare pickup locations at the park and rides. So many of you have probably heard of RTD's partnerships, particularly with Uber, but we also have partnerships with Lyft as well. So for people who could potentially get there using TNCs, we wanna give them priority in terms of making a smooth transition, physical transition between TNCs and transit. And then also leveraging variable message signs. So people who are traveling down I-25, which is the uh, primary expressway nearby uh, Wagon Road, could they uh, potentially be given information where they would understand that in many cases, transit can actually get you downtown faster than driving alone, particularly with the addition of high occupancy vehicle lanes that have been recently added to I-25 that our buses use. In Federal Alameda, we're very much focused on bicycle, or I'm sorry, micro mobility and pedestrian accessibility. So the image on the top right is actually taken from Denver's Vision Zero process where they're looking at making mid-block safe pedestrian crossings in order to access transit stops, as well as identifying partnerships with the micro mobility companies to uh, park and, or deploy their vehicles nearby those services. So lastly, I'm going to kind of go through these last pieces fairly quickly because we are running short on time, but most of these following slides, again, focus on that partnerships piece. So this is just an illustrative slide to really indicate how some of uh, the first and last mile projects have uh, taken shape, and I'll use some examples here a little bit later. This is a flow chart in terms of how different types of first and last mile projects can happen. And a good example here is when you start thinking about uh, TDM programs uh, or transportation demand management, these are traditionally led by transportation demand management organizations. RTD doesn't necessarily get involved with that, but it is extremely important in terms of people understanding what transit incentives are available. Kevin talked about GoTober to start with. These are fun events that people get excited about using alternative mode of, modes of transportation, and they're really well advertised by TMOs uh, and TMAs. Uh, but without the partnership of those organizations, we would have less understanding and availability 
of what transit incentives are available. The pilot projects that we developed, and again, these are kind of our, our primary focus areas right now, are the development of a regional wayfinding signage system that would be focused on bicycles and pedestrians, the pilot of a mobility hub concept in a variety of different station contexts that I mentioned. So looking at how a mo mobility hub might look in an urban core, urban, suburban mix, suburban residential typology, and then better deploying microtransit. We recently rebranded our service as FlexRide um, and reduced the amount of time necessary in order to book this service from two hours to 10 minutes to try to, again, compete, not necessarily compete, I shouldn't have said that, but uh, you know, better accommodate people's expectations for what uh, they get in terms of on-demand service. Most people are familiar with using Uber and Lyft. Uh, we're trying to move the needle from what we have previously provided to better match consumer expectations. So a lot of these partnerships, many of you are probably familiar with, we have license agreements with all of the scooter companies in the Denver market right now. Um, and the primary uh, focus there is to define the locations, physical locations where they can deploy on RTD property. We have our 61 AD project that recently wrapped up, which was primarily a technology proof of concept. Uh, it was definitely not focused on ridership, but it was an important proof of concept um, to, and that we developed some very important lessons learned from. And then our partnerships with uh, Transit App. Most recently, if you're familiar or you have that on your phone, you can now use that to develop a multimodal trip itinerary where it would potentially help you to access transit using a variety of different modes, including micro mobility. And then most recently, we've enabled the ability for people to actually purchase an RTD ticket on Transit App as well as in the Uber app as well. Lastly, I wanna close with uh, this slide here, which is the use of this framework. We uh, recognize that we weren't able to look at every station throughout the district specifically. So we developed essentially a more generalized uh, process for how we went through the representative station analysis. And we've made that available in the plan. And, uh, I'll just kind of close here um, when we, um, uh, I think, as was mentioned previously, um, RTD is launching a reimagine uh, process where we're looking at our entire service area and looking at how we can potentially uh, improve upon our service area and the services that we provide. And when you think about first and last mile, um, services really matter and, and many of you are probably close to or have available to yourselves a really great transit line and I imagine that you might do uh, a lot in order to access that transit service um, and when you think about transit service in first and last mile if you have a really poor transit service you can have a sidewalk that's paved in gold and if the transit service is not good, you're not going to need to access it and first and last mile isn't gonna be helpful in that sense. So it's really important that we think about the separation of first and last mile and transit service and um, help people to get to those services that are really good and, and hopefully create a network where you have all of our services that are, are so good that people will do what they need to in order to get to uh, but then accommodate them when they want to get there. So thank you all for your time. This is my contact information. Again, I just want to mention our webpage, which is most easily accessible by just Googling RTD first and last mile. Check that out um, and definitely shoot me an email if you have any questions about that. Well, thank you so much, Paul. Um, that was really informative and we've got a couple questions, um, but please, as you are, um, you know, as you're as you're reflecting on the session and, and what you just heard, please feel free to continue submitting questions in the questions box in your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, we do have a couple questions. Um, I'm going to kick things off, uh, and this can be addressed to, to both of you. 
Um, do you have resources or toolkits or guides that were instructive to you as you were coming up with these plans um, that you'd want the audience to know about specifically? I can get started. Um, so typically, since this is a regional plan, we obviously engage some of our peer NPOs that have good, great resources. So if you're not from the Denver region, I would encourage you to reach out to your NPO. Um, and they have awesome resources. But other than that, in terms of Federal Highway Administration resources, we utilize the Small Town and Rural Design Guide and the Bikeway Selection Guide. The Bikeway Selection Guide came out at the, towards the end of our planning process, but we were able to integrate some of those um, kind of that focus on high comfort facilities from that guide. And it really is um, a great tool as you're thinking through whether it's updating the street stand or standards or developing active transportation plans um, to check out. But additionally, we wanted to kind of provide a toolkit and guide in our own plan. So if you would like to use the active transportation plan as a resource source, I definitely encourage you to check out that emerging trends and approaches for a local implementation in the Dr. Cog ATP. And again, you can find that um, at drcog.org slash ATP. Yeah, and I'll just pick up on that. I mean, the, the first and last mile plan was really, it was important to us that we developed it in a way that was a, a framework for uh, you know local governments, TMAs, uh, DOTs and others to use. It's not intended to be prescriptive in that sense. So we think, you know, our plan as well uh, as Emily's is really an important guidebook itself for people to refer to. Uh, but again, I think depending on where you're coming from, if you're a local government, you know, there are probably more of an interest in terms of the new uh, infrastructure and reuse of in infrastructure because those are the elements that you are most influencing of. If you're a TMA, uh, you know, the best focus area is probably on those transportation demand management uh, elements. And uh, likewise, you know, if you are, um, you know, a, a, a DOT or an MPO, uh, maybe you're focused on something different. So again, it really depends on the first and last mile improvement that you're hoping to make uh, in terms of what you're going to reference because you know the toolkit that I mentioned I, I just focused on those five themes but within those five themes there's literally innumerable numbers of strategies that you could take to address first and last mile so it, it depends on what you have control over um, in terms of how you might focus your uh, attention on those resources. Great. Um, we do have a question from the audience uh, specifically about micromobility in the Denver region. Um, so kind of like what's the general landscape? How much do we know about micromobility? And then um, are we, for, for planning purposes, were, was the ATP looking more at kind of consumer side? Did it also look at um, kind of the supplier or provider side, um, and that could be similarly answered for the, for the first and final one on plan, first class one on plan. Good question. Do we know if this person is from the Denver region? We do. Okay. So then I don't need to go into all of the details. Um, basically, micromobility, I think that includes, Dr. Cox's kind of working definition is small electric and human powered devices like bikes and like scooters. So I think it kind of naturally fit into the conversation about active transportation. That said, we kicked off the ATP in late 2017. So scooters were not really a problem that people were encountering. Um, and then about midway through our planning process, you know, scooters are dropped. Um, Jocko's bike share is out. Like there was a lot of movement during the planning process, which I think you know, no one can really anticipate exactly when uh, new devices hit the street, but I think we kind of dealt with it in the context of active transportation, thinking about, you know, where do smaller lightweight devices belong, um, talking through kind of the, the policy implications to active transportation related policies and street design um, and parking. Um, but this is really something that is addressed kind of as an implementation item so that Dr. Cog and its member governments should really kind of continue to talk about micromobility. Um, and additionally, this is another plan that we didn't talk about today, <laughs> uh, but Dr. Cog was kind of concurrently developing the mobility choice blueprint. 
which really looks at emerging technologies in transportation and mobility. And um, there was a tactical action in that plan as well that looked, that encouraged folks to think regionally about micromobility. And so as a result of kind of both of those planning efforts, Dr. Craig convened a regional working group um, with local government staff from across the region, from small communities and from big communities to really talk about micromobility and what that means. Um, from the civic side, how does it work to kind of support our public goals, some of our performance targets, um, and just to talk through kind of the policy implications. So we're not seeing, you know, each of the 58 communities in the Denver region reinvent the wheel, but really like work together to evaluate what works and doesn't work in terms of scooters and bike share um, and whatever new device comes out in a couple months. Yeah, I would just add on to that. Um, you know, Emily mentioned that, that uh, you know, scooters came out in, in late 2017, and, and that was right around the same time that we were kicking off our first and last mile plan as well. And uh, it was a shock, to say the least, to I think not only uh, the local, you know, the city and county of Denver when scooters first arrived, because they didn't necessarily uh, do so with permission. Uh, and later they were able to be fitted under a, a permit program. But I think within RTD, there was definitely um, a reaction which uh, we weren't necessarily sure how we should be looking at um, accommodating them. But obviously we did. Uh, inevitably, we ended up coming to an agreement where we developed these license agreements with each of the operators and I would say that the primary reason why we did that was because A, we knew they were gonna be there whether we had the license agreements or not. So we wanted to be able to have something in writing that enabled us to have direct communication with the scooter companies if we, if we were finding them to be an issue. But maybe on a more holistic level, um, you know, RTD has actually been losing ridership for the last four to five years. And a lot of transit, transit agencies around the country are really looking at how they can reverse that trend. And I think one of the most promising concepts that have come from that examination has been this concept of mobility as a service. And really what that is all about is focusing um, multimodal uh, trips, whether that be uh, micromobility, shared scooters, e-scooters, uh, transit agencies, TNCs, and focusing those trips together so that we can focus on a common enemy, which is single occupancy vehicle trips. You know, Emily showed a slide that indicated the numbers of people uh, who are using those uh, shared modes or those micro modes. Um, but I think the poll that uh, Kevin took to begin this was very telling. 50% of the people who uh, tuned into this webinar, who I actually would like to think are probably fairly enlightened people, um, you know, they they drove self-selecting, self self-selecting, right? <laughs> so you know, you all tuned into this webinar, um, and yet 50% of you, you know, drove alone. And um, obviously, that that rate is much higher when you look at the uh, general population. But that should be um, our our focus, and I think RTD's focus when we inevitably decided to partner with uh, scooters, because yes, scooter trips undoubtedly are probably taking transit trips uh, away uh, in the central business district of Denver. Uh, however, uh, are they complementing transit trips where somebody is maybe attempting to access uh, some of our commuter rail services that are a little further outside of the central business district? So I think there's an example where you could say we're probably competing for trips, uh, and there's also examples where we're complementing each other. I think in those complementing examples, that's what, what makes the uh, the basis for why we would want to partner with them. Great, thank you. Um, we there is one question out there, um, kind of about the um, kind of the practical side of of making these types of plans. Um, so we do have someone who's asking if these plans were developed internally or by a consultant, and if you can give some idea about budget for, for taking on these undertakings? Sure, so Dr. Cox for the active transportation plan, uh, it was a joint effort. We did some of the work in house um, with, we have a pretty awesome GIS and information systems team that we worked with on mapping and data analytics. Um, but we also did use a consultant um, 
for part of the work. So we kind of divvied that up in the scope. I think the budget was around 200,000 um, and the planning process lasted a little over 12 months. So that's kind of roughly what happened. But we really did want to utilize the skills um, and capabilities that we had in house where we could uh, because there was not a ton to draw from budget wise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had a $400,000 budget um, and we hired um, Urban Trans was our prime consultant. Uh, they did a great job uh, helping us through this. There were uh, multiple subs, uh, I, Alta, uh, HDR, as well as the Shared Use Mobility Center helped us through this whole process. Um, but as Emily said, mentioned, you know, we also drew from a lot of internal resources as well in terms of you know getting data about ridership and uh you know different things like that where it would be obviously harder for a consultant to get those things so um, in the end it was a, a shared um sort of lift but we had a great partnership with our consultants um there's still time for a couple more questions so keep submitting those through the questions box um, what type of metrics might we look at uh, if we want to track implementation uh, of these plans? Um, and could you just provide some information on uh, your agency's implementation activities? And kind of to that question as well, if you could talk about how you plan to work with local governments to ultimately implement some of the, the efforts. Yeah, metrics, I'll start with that. Um, obviously, the, the most important metrics to an agency, a transit agency, is going to be ridership. So uh, to the degree that we can essentially correlate first and last mile improvements with ridership, uh, that sometimes gets a little difficult because of the number of influences on transit ridership. Frequently, gas prices are cited. Uh, we're also seeing vehicle ownership having a huge impact on transit ridership in terms of correlative factors. Um, however, that is certainly something that we would look at in terms of if a first and last mile improvement led to ridership. Probably a more initial metric is going to be perception. That's something that we measure through a biannual uh, customer satisfaction survey, which is more of a qualitative survey that, that helps to assess how people feel about RTD. Uh, obviously, there's a range of opinions about uh, the agency, um, but what we're attempting to do is measure what those trends are over time through that survey. So, you know, are people viewing uh, transit accessibility better than they did um, in the previous survey, those are things that we would attempt to track. In terms of partnerships with local governments, that's really where we're, part, where, where we're focused right now. Uh, we want to develop those partnerships. Again, when we look at transit access, right away has a huge impact on that. And uh, the thing is, is that a lot of local governments already have first and last mile projects in the works. So we're looking at uh, for those of you who did go to that web page, updating uh, an online map that would help to identify where first and last mile projects have been done throughout the district, uh, both ones that RTD is involved with and then ones where we're not, uh, because we think that has a really good um, resource for other local governments to define what first and last mile improvements they could make. So that's something that we're going to continue to work on and, um, you know, Funding is always an issue, but um, you know there are certainly places, uh, Dr. Cog being the most prominent example, uh, where funding is available to uh, fund the first and last mile projects. Yeah, no, that's awesome, Paul. I think we kind of reiterate the sentiment about partnerships with local governments are like everything when we think about implementing these plans. And Dr. Cog routinely works with each of its 58 member governments. Um, whether it's through our traditional committee process or it's plan specific stakeholder groups or it's ad hoc work groups, um, we're always reaching out to figure out how we can partner. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, MetroVision, our regional plan, identifies specific performance targets. So we're really focusing on tracking progress towards those. The active transportation plan also identifies some baseline indicators. Um, you can find that again at drpark.org slash ATP. Um, but in terms of implementation activities, 
I think we've already kind of gotten started again, like with that regional micromobility work group. Um, and we recently updated our bicycle facility inventory schema to kind of better align with some of the goals around comfort and connectivity of our bicycle system. Um, and thinking about bike count programs and thinking through kind of how we ex collect existing data and how we can kind of continue to integrate active transportation data points um, into that process. Great. And thank both of you. I uh, thank you so much for, for joining us today and for presenting. Um, it is 12 o'clock, and so we will uh, end the session. Um, but just a heads up, stay alert for notice of the next MetroVision ID Exchange webinar. We don't quite have a date yet, uh, but we will be featuring the winner of the Great Places, the inaugural Great Places in Colorado Award um, and uh, APA Colorado with that as well. Um, so thank you so much for listening in today, and have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week.